Hola, from Puerto Rico, or as a local would say, Puerto Rico. <laughs> All packed and ready for our red-eye flight to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Seven hours and one connecting flight later, we arrived. Let's go! Let's go! Puerto Rico! Pause. I wish it were as simple as booking a flight and showing up, but as we all know, those days don't exist anymore. So let me show you what we had to do to plan and prepare for our trip. Let's rewind a bit. The time has finally come to plan my next adventure. I'm so excited, guys. It's been over a year since I've taken an international trip. I know technically Puerto Rico is not an international destination since it's part of the US, but very much is its own culture. So now I'm gonna jump in and do some research and see what I need to do to make sure we don't run into any hiccups when it comes to any COVID restrictions. Let's do it. Most important thing you need to do is complete a travel declaration form showing a negative test taken at most 72 hours prior to your departure. You fill out a form on this travel PR site, upload your test results, and you'll receive a confirmation email that looks like this. You can complete the form once you arrive, but you'll save the time and headache doing it before and having it printed out. Once it's scanned, you're good to go. Now getting around by car is easiest here, so I highly recommend renting one. There was a free airport shuttle for our off-terminal spot. We thought we were getting a sedan, so we got a good laugh when they brought us our car. Robin in the mini bed. No, we didn't even need an Airbnb. So I just slept back there. We decided to stay on the east side of the island in Fajardo for our first two nights since we planned on visiting Culebra by ferry early the next morning. It's a beautiful little town surrounded by pristine beaches and is also home to the largest marina in the Caribbean. We found a cozy bed and breakfast on Airbnb with a highly rated rooftop cafe, all run by Senora Gladys, who welcomed us upon check-in and showed us our room. Cute, cozy, and all you really need in a place to lay your head down for some rest. She was very kind and motherly and made us feel right at home. Once we settled and changed, it was time to eat. Mofongo relleno de camarones y filete de pescado con arroz y habichuelas, two very traditional Puerto Rican dishes. Mofongo is one of the more unique dishes here. It's made of mashed fried plantains and traditionally served with fried meat and chicken broth soup. But you can get it with any type of meat or go for the veggie option. Had a couple of cold ones to wash down our dinner. Medalla is the popular national lager you'll see everywhere. And had a couple of shots of Don Q rum to go with them. Cap the night off with one more round at another little local bar with a good vibe. Started off the morning by taking in the view of the sunrise from the rooftop cafe. I definitely get why she named it Vistas Cafe. What a view. Today we're gonna make our way over to Culebra. It is 7.20 a.m. Our ferry leaves at 9 a.m. We should be on the island by 10 a.m. Some Let's go. This is one of the other things you will have to plan for in advance. Culebra ferry rides are super limited capacity right now for tourists, so it's really hard to get tickets. Borferry.com is the official ticketing site for Culebra trips. You'll have to book two one-way rides, which comes out to about $4.50 a person. Tickets are typically released two weeks in advance, but honestly it varies, so I'd recommend checking every day because once they're released, you've got to snag them. The other thing you'll have to do is pay for any additional items you're taking, like umbrellas, chairs, anything like that. We're taking a cooler, which requires a ticket as well. There's a $7 a day parking fee and a shuttle that takes you straight to the terminal. Time to pack the necessities and make our way to Culebra. They don't allow cloth masks, so I had to buy a pack of these. Everyone was nice and socially distanced as we waited to board our ferry. At 9 a.m. on the dot, it was time to go. This is what full capacity for these ferry rides looks like right now. So as you can see, tickets are very limited. Take in those views. The wind and the sun and the ocean mist felt incredible. 
After a 55-minute ride, we arrived at Culebra, which means snake in English. We were greeted by Hector el Protector, a wooden sculpture built by Thomas Dambo, who actually needed to resurrect him in 2019 after being knocked out by Hurricane Maria. He holds a very special place in the locals' hearts. Culebra sits 17 miles east of the mainland and is approximately 7 by 5 miles. We booked an Airbnb experience to paddleboard beforehand, so we made the 10-minute walk to the meeting point. Our guide was a local named Norman, who started off by educating us on the island. And then it was time to paddleboard. He went over the do's and don'ts, showed us how to set our paddle heights, and we were off. I did pretty good. I definitely got the hang of it. My boo, not so much. Capped off the experience with the little dip, and we were off to the part I was looking forward to the most, relaxing on Flamenco Beach. It's a short taxi ride over, shouldn't cost more than three to five dollars per person. But we were able to hitch a ride with the couple that paddleboarded with us, so that was sweet. You'll see several taxis waiting there, so I'd suggest lining yours up for your ride back to the ferry terminal. Welcome to Flamenco Beach. Not even the gray skies can hide the beauty of this place. We got a nice little tropical shower to welcome us, but it quickly dissipated. Flamenco Beach is a one and a half mile long, crescent-shaped beach on the north side of Culebra. It has consistently ranked as one of the top beaches in the world with its picture-perfect stretch of white sand and turquoise waters. When those clouds move out of the sun's way, those vibrant colors really come through. Also, so does the sun, so pack on the sunscreen. We got so burned. And that right there is our cue to go. We finished out the night back in Fajardo at Costa Mia restaurant where we were conveniently able to order drinks from the walk-up bar window and make our own little salsa dance floor while we waited to be seated. It was a successful day. The next morning we went up to the rooftop where Senora Gladys was there to greet us with a warm welcome and a fresh plate of fruit. My garden I have for you the fresh coconut. From here from Las Proavas we have the mango, banana and the papaya. We enjoyed a great breakfast, took in the view one last time, said our goodbyes, and hit the road for our next adventure, hiking El Yunque National Forest. This is something else you'll have to make reservations for ahead of time. If you go to recreation.gov, click into El Yunque, you'll be able to reserve a vehicle ticket. Once you choose the date, you'll have the option to select either a morning entry pass from 8 to 11 or an afternoon one from 12 to 3. You can stay until it closes at 6 p.m. with either ticket. Those are just the windows of time you can enter. You'll give your name and confirmation at the entrance and you're good to go. Right after entering, you are greeted by the beautiful Coca Falls. The waters drop 85 feet onto a huge dark rock formation. There are several hiking trails scattered throughout the forest to choose from, although there are a couple that are closed at the moment. After Coca Falls, we stopped at Yokahu Tower an observation tower built in 1962 to give tourists a chance to appreciate the beauty of the forest. We couldn't go up to the top deck at the time, but still enjoy the incredible views. After that stop, we kept driving until we made it to the Mount Britain Trail area, which is also where you'll be able to make your way to El Yunque Peak, the highest point in the forest. The maps do a great job of explaining trail distance, time, and level of difficulty. Based on those estimates, it was going to take us about two and a half hours to make it up to the peak. The trail starts off nice and paved, but as you continue up El Yunque Trail, it starts getting a bit rockier, a bit muddier, or in other words, more fun. The panoramic views of the cloud-covered peaks, sweeping valleys, and turquoise coastlines will take your breath away. It's a crazy feeling when you realize you are on a mountain peak. The lush foliage surrounding you gives the illusion of having lots of flat land around, but nope, you are on the edge of a mountain. Pretty surreal. There's a summit observatory at the very top that was built in the 1930s. This is where you'll see the US survey benchmark of the elevation. We made it! On the way back down, I put my ecologist hat on and really stopped to appreciate all the beautiful living things around me. 
El Yunque is home to over 200 species of trees and other plants. You'll see hawks and colorful birds, a mongoose or two, and keep your eyes peeled for the biggest snails you'll ever see. This tree snail had me mesmerized for a bit. One thing that you'll hear everywhere but not necessarily see is one of Puerto Rico's native frog species or their unofficial national mascot, the Coqui. Listen closely. Their name is an onomatopoeia, meaning they were named after the sound they make. Coqui. Checked into our next Airbnb, a cute little loft with a super Pac-Man, which was sweet, and an incredible 20th floor view of the city skyline. Spent the evening exploring the Condado Beach area and called it an early night. We spent our last day in the colorful and charming cobblestone streets of Viejo San Juan, the heart of Puerto Rican history and culture. We started at El Morro, one of the largest forts built by the Spanish during the 16th century. It has six staggered levels that integrate barracks, dungeons, storerooms, and include some of the original cannons. When enemy ships would try to enter the bay, El Morro and a smaller fort a half mile across the bay would create a crossfire that no enemy was able to get past. Thanks to these two forts, the Spaniards were able to defend Puerto Rico from invasions by the British, Dutch, and pirates. In 1961, the U.S. Army retired it and established a museum. We didn't actually go inside, just enjoyed a nice little frolic through the grass area and took in the view from the entrance. Next up on the list, Wander. Well, rum first, then wander. We stumbled upon a hidden gem called Café Hijos de Borinquen. Borinquen was actually the name of the island before the Spanish arrived. Great speakeasy with delicious and strong cocktails. The last thing we did on this trip, and this is an absolute must do, was night kayaking at Bioluminescent Bay, an ecosystem that contains organisms known as dinoflagellates that produce a glowing phenomenon in the water. Puerto Rico has three of the only five bio bays in the whole world. Highly recommend the company we went with, Pure Adventures PR. And I wish I had footage to show you guys, but I ain't got that type of gear or skills when it comes to lighting. You just really have to experience it. It was a short and sweet trip and we only scratched the surface, but we took it all in and enjoyed every moment. Gracias Puerto Rico.